Hi on Facebook. Happy Friday. I uh, hope you survived the polar vortex. I, um, as many of you know, I have a daughter who goes to college in Minneapolis, so having seen that it's minus 25 there, I don't feel like I can complain about uh, minus 13, which is what my day started off this morning. Uh, my, my morning commute went from minus 13 uh, to plus 12, so it was it, nothing like making, you know, 15 or 12 or 15 degrees feel like a heat wave. Um, so another busy week. I wanted to take you through uh, a few things that have been going on. Um, a lot of the background of what's happening uh, right now in, in Hertford is, as I talked about last week, people, a lot of thousands of bill concepts have been submitted and now they're, um, some of them are getting uh, combined and committees are raising things and lots of legislators are advocating for the raising of those bills in front of the, uh, asking the committee chairs to raise those bills or um, getting more research done, hearing from lobbyists, of course, hearing from constituents on both sides of issues to try to figure out what the best way forward. And as I've said many times, um, legislation isn't always the best solution to things, but um, sometimes putting the concept out there and having a conversation is a good way to figure out um, uh, the best path forward. So um, what I want, I'm going to go quickly through uh, the bills that, that my name is attached to so far, but I wanted to start off with um, the point that some things that I'm working on that are very important to me, you won't see bills attached to my name. And there can be different reasons for that. So one example is gun safety. Uh, that was a big part of the campaign, and Connecticut is a leader in its gun safety laws and as a result has one of the lowest um, gun fatality rates in the country, and we should be very proud of that. And that has been uh, a bipartisan success. So um, today we had a press conference today to highlight uh, the various four bills in particular that the Judiciary Committee, on which I sit, uh, will take up this year, um, many of which have bipartisan support. Um, so I didn't propose any bills that relate to gun safety because I knew that the committee that I was on and the leadership, I had conversations with the leadership of the Judiciary Committee, I knew these concepts would get raised. And so uh, that's a good way to go about it. So today's press conference um, highlighted four gun safety bills that the committee is going to move forward. One is a, a ban on ghost guns, which many of you um, have helped advocate for last year, which passed the House uh, and I think not the Senate, it didn't make it through. Um, so that's going forward again. Um, also two safe storage bills for, the, currently it is a felony in Connecticut to, uh, if, if you have an um, unsecured loaded weapon that is used in a crime, you can be um, convicted of a felony. Uh, there's proposal to, to make that expanded to um, unloaded weapons as well and there's been there was a particularly tragic case here uh, uh, for which this legislation is named it's uh, called Ethan's law because of, uh, of a child who who died because of a, a an unloaded weapon that was in a cardboard box uh, with the ammunition right next to it so so two parts of that one is sa requiring safe storage for for unloaded weapons in the home and in a car. And it's important to note that that's not, that doesn't apply in all instances, but only where there are minors present. And, and we're, we're proposing to adjust that from uh, kids under 16 to kids under 18. Uh, and also, um, uh, it, uh, in your car. <laughs> Sorry, lost track of my thought there. Um, so, oh, and then the, the fourth bill is a, with respect to open carry, and some of you may have followed this last term, uh, there was a proposal to allow law enforcement to, when they see uh, someone who is openly carrying a firearm, um, uh, ask them to show their permit. And, and the bill, among other reasons, it, 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 it got some scrutiny because there was con some concern that that might have racial impact and it might... Um, you know, people of color might be asked to produce proof for for um, for having a firearm uh, with greater frequency than others. So that remains a concern, but but the bill is moving forward in the hopes that we can address that in in a way that will give assurance. Um, so another area in which you will not see isn't really uh, you won't see my name attached to a bill, but it probably in my mind is among the most important uh, work that I'm going to be doing here, and that's my work on the appropriations committee, um, and that's a process. That's not you know there isn't going to be a bill that says fix the budget, 
uh, solve the pension crisis. Uh, that's is much more complicated than that. And it's going to be, it, it will, I mean, uh, uh, had a seasoned legislator tell me the other day that, you know, if you're going to know anything about the legislative process, you either have to take a deep dive on the finance committee, which handles the revenue side, or on appropriations, which handles the expense side. And if you don't, you'll never get a sense of how all the pieces have to get, get um, the puzzle pieces have to get matched up. So um, that's, uh, you know, a process of asking tough questions of every governmental agency and program and making sure that we're spending our scarce, precious resources, your scarce, precious resources, carefully. Um, so that process starts uh, really with the, gov so the governor submits his budget on February 20th. And then uh, very quickly, that the, the, the broader budget gets submitted. And then I think the next day, the budget gets submitted uh, that's broken up into subcommittees. And there are 13 subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee. Um, and they will all be holding hearings, I'm told, by uh, the leadership uh, uh, chairman, Chair Tony Walker, that basically I won't be doing much else from late February until early March, uh, but, but going to these uh, hearings uh, and, and asking a lot of questions of, of the government to, to understand how we're, they're proposing to, to spend our resources. Um, so of those um, committees, uh, I am sitting on five of them, uh, regulation, um, Conservation and Development, Health, Judicial and Corrections, and Collective Bargaining. So um, looking forward to doing some reading over the weekend to see the look at, look, take a deep dive into their budgets for prior years. Uh, so those are two areas that you're not going to see bills associated with. So then let me take you through, hopefully pretty quickly, <laughs> some of the bills that I submitted. If you check again on the website on the little tab that says legislation, you'll see a whole list of all the bills that have my name attached to them. Um, uh, but they that you know they mean different things. Like some of those were bills that I proposed and and got co-sponsors for. Some of them were bills that I signed onto with other legislators. Um, so I'm going to take you through the first category are bills that I really um, uh, uh, put through uh, initially myself. And it's important to note before I go through them that every single one of these was done. Uh, at the request of, of a number of constituents, constituents who um, persuaded me that at least it was worth having the conversation, um, if that doesn't necessarily mean that the legislative solution is the best way forward. So um, the first one, which I've already talked about a few times, is plastic bags. Uh, and, and I think, as I've said before, I, I, that, like gun safety, I knew that would get raised in the Environment Committee. Um, and it will as a committee bill. Um, but I am looking forward to working on that particular issue with a, a group of eighth graders uh, from, from Kellogg who have written me some really terrific letters and done a lot of research. And so we're going to work on that issue together. Um, another one uh, is uh, House Bill 6149, which is, uh, relates to the oversight of nonprofit hospitals. And that is one that I'm actually having a lot of meetings with healthcare, uh, the Office of Health Strategy here, uh, and others in this world, uh, and it's and it's uh, it, this is a very conceptual con conceptual uh, thing at the moment, um, but it's an effort to try to figure out whether there's a better way forward for nonprofit community hospitals to be accountable to the community for the promises they make to the community in terms of serving its needs and, and a way to ensure that the community remains involved in that conversation. So that, that will be um, developing as we go forward. Uh, another one is uh, 6424, which is the poll attachment bill. Um, that I, I um, ha was co-sponsored by Representative Elliott and Representative Steinberg. Um, and I worked with Northwest Connect, um, which many of you may be aware of. And it's part of a broader effort to, to improve digital infrastructure uh, for the whole state, but certainly from our perspective for the Northwest Corner, where it is a real issue. And this particular bill relates to um, asking the regu rele relevant regulatory body to create a streamlined process by which uh, an organization or a company can get access to the to the telephone poles. Now, this is not uh, municipal gain, which you've heard me talk about before. This is, um, th in other words, these are people who would pay uh, our utilities for access to the poll. But there's already on the books a process by which people can do that, but it can get very held up. So um, we're looking to to create a more streamlined process for them to do that. Um, another bill is 6525, 
which relates to um, property tax exemption for healthcare institutions. And that um, arose out of several conversations I had with people who were involved with, uh, with GEAR in uh, North Canaan uh, and the tax situation that it faced. And, and my aim in speaking to a lot of them was try to figure out a way to improve the process so that um, to make uh, standards more transparent and clear and to not have these sudden changes so that so that a nonprofit uh, like gear can plan for the future and understand um, so this is going to be a process the original bill has some language in it that may be a little bit broad honestly uh, I've had conversations with people which have who have pointed out that that as it stands that may be uh, that standard may end would end up taking a lot of healthcare institutions uh, off the tax rolls entirely that have been paying taxes uh, uh, in the past, and and that you know may not. So I'm looking forward to getting that that I'm I have uh, submitted to the Office of Fiscal Analysis here, so that I can get an understanding of what the cost associated with that b would be, because I I think that's I, I pay attention to that issue. Um, the 6551 is the uh, pilot program. There are several versions of this. Um, a pilot program to allow uh, municipalities who wish to participate, only those who wish to participate, to uh, have a conveyance, to add a conveyance fee um, for um, property transfer that could be spent, of, I think, no more than 1%, uh, that could be spent on either open space or affordable housing. So there are some proposals being uh, floated here that are focused on the open space part, others on the affordable housing part, and I've had, particularly amongst the nine my office lights are going off. Uh, the nine towns, you know, there are some towns that are more concerned about affordable housing, and they feel like they, they're pretty, they're pretty, you know, good on on the preservation of green space. And other towns want to focus on green space, and so I want to have the conversation with other legislators who have proposed this to figure out whether we could allow towns the flexibility, and particularly because this is a pilot program, and it would only include towns that that voluntarily participate in this. Um, uh, the next one, uh, 6591, you may have heard, has gathered some, garnered some attention uh, because it relates to Lime Rock. And, and for this, this is one of those situations where I, I have to apologize if this ambushed people because, um, you know, and partly because I'm a freshman and partly because of the timing of when bill concepts are due. Uh, this got submitted and in an ideal world, I would have had a lot more conversation with people ahead of time to, to, to have people have a better understanding of what the intentions were here. So, um, so let me skip first of all to the bottom line. This relates to, um, the, or the concept that I, I submitted relates, to, to, seeks to answer the question of what governmental body is best situated to, to weigh the costs and benefits of, of Sunday racing in particular? Um, because there is a, I'll spare you the long history and painful history, because I, honestly, Lime Rock in decades past has been regulated in a truly appalling way. Um, uh, a current court ruling which says that the town, of course, as it has for many decades past, every town, uh, and this is true of every town and every racetrack throughout the state, um, has the ability to regulate race times every day of the week, um, except that a recent, a, a 1998 amendment to the state statute governing this uh, preempted the town's ability to regulate on Sunday. So as currently stands, towns can do whatever they want as long as it's reasonable uh, Monday through Saturday and can't, can't, uh, the, they can't can't make any rulings with respect to Sundays, which seems a little bit backward. But I do understand that that there are many issues here, in particular, you know, in, in, with a business, an important business like Lime Rock, that um, uh, the benefits of which uh, go far beyond Salisbury, where it's located. Uh, I know that I've spoken to to people in the um, hospitality industry in Torrington, and they really benefit from race weekends. Um, other, you know, restaurants and hotels in Falls Village, who which really benefit. So this is a complex issue, and I, to be clear, I'm in no way taking a position on Sunday racing. I don't think that should be the state's job. Um, but to skip to the bottom line on that one, because there is ongoing um, litigation in this case, and it's in fact under uh, appeal to the Connecticut Supreme Court, I don't think it's a good idea to intervene in that litigation that should proceed uh, without um, uh, prejudice. So uh, I have spoken today to the chair of the committee who is not going to raise that bill. Um, 
and we can revisit that conversation once the court case ends. Uh, and I know there are people on both sides of this issue which feel very, who feel very strongly. And uh, I'll note that I'm looking forward to holding office hours in Falls Village next week at the firehouse on Thursday night. I think that's February 7th uh, at 6.30. So I hope you can join me because I really do want to hear from, from people uh, who have strong feelings about this issue and I think uh, felt like they didn't get heard. And that, that's important for me to, to, to hear that. Um, so uh, what else is left? There's one, uh, another bill that um, uh, is a state constitutional amendment to allow for no excuse absentee voting. Uh, as it currently stands, in order to vote absentee, you have to swear, in fact, that you won't be here that day. And that's hard for people because people don't always know. Um, and it'd be easier if they could make a, um, but in order to change that, that requires a constitutional amendment. So that's a long conversation. Um, so those are the bills that are most, so then I also uh, sponsored a few bills with uh, regional, uh, with some with Michelle Cook, who represents Torrington, and some with Michelle Cook and Senator Kevin Whitkos. Um, uh, and those are with Michelle Cook, with, there's a bill uh, regarding elderly nutrition, uh, uh, co-pays for ultrasound breast cancer screenings. Um, uh, so, uh, another one, here's one I'd like to highlight, it, it, transport basically after. So. It, this relates to, to opiate um, overdoses. And at the moment, if in an emergency situation, if someone is administered Narcan, which is the reviving uh, drug, which allow, you know, brings, effectively brings somebody back to life after a drug overdose, uh, currently there's no requirement that they be connected to any further health services. And uh, Michelle Cook and I have been um, in, in conversation with for example, Maria Kutat Skinner of the McCall Foundation, of the, of the importance of recognizing that just because somebody's been revived does not mean that the crisis is over and it's really important to get them connected to resources. And we want to do that in a way that is uh, manageable. Um, in other words, we, don't, we want to make sure we're connecting them to resources which actually are available. Um, so that's going to be uh, an ongoing conversation. Uh, also an act regarding um, staffing levels for, for CNAs at nursing homes. Um, and some signage for the 9-11 uh, memorial at the at Torrington um, Firehouse and for the nutmeg in, a conserv uh, in, uh, in Torrington. So, uh, and then there are two, yeah, two bills that, that I have co-sponsored with both Michelle Cook, Representative Cook, and Senator Whitkos. Uh, one is concerns bonding for um, Five Points, which is a gallery in Torrington, which uh, is uh, proposing to take over the Yukon Torrington campus and um, begin a, a um, an arts school. And uh, there's a lot of excitement about that. Uh, and then a bill regarding the Warner Theater to make sure it gets uh, uh, adequate funding to continue the incredible. Um, programs that it offers. So that's it for um, bills. Uh, just to highlight a few events, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for a fantastic Legislators Breakfast last weekend. Uh, they are That audience is always really well informed, and we talked about criminal justice, uh, school consolidation, the challenges there, environmental issues, um, really wide-ranging conversation, and, and met a lot of great people. So thank you for that. Uh, we did have one um, session this week uh, in which we approved the renomination of several judges and some other uh, uh, statewide offices. Um, and that's about it, other than that, that what I already mentioned, which is I'm going to have office hours next week in Falls Village at the Firehouse at 6.30, from 6.30 to 8. So I hope you can join me there. And hope you have a great week. Thanks for tuning in. Sorry, this is a long one. If you're still hanging in there, cheers to you. Thanks.